Back by popular demand, this is the Turnbuckle Pad Podcast on YouTube.com. Respect wrestling or get out. Gentlemen, welcome back to the Turnbuckle Pad Podcast, and today I bring to you a major, major name. He happened to be one of my favorites growing up, and he was always one of those guys I wish would have got that heavyweight title, because he was that cool and that awesome to watch. Men want to be him, and the ladies love him. Welcome my guest to the show, Buff Daddy himself, Buff Bagwell. Buff, thanks for coming to the show. It's going very well. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. We got a lot of interesting questions we wanted to ask you about in your experience with the business and your journey. Um, how's things going with you right now? Because I know you're back in the independent scene. How do you how are you enjoying that? Uh, you know, to me, the independent circuit is uh, to me it's much it's, it's really really a lot more uh, more competitive than the independent circuit is. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot more competitive for sure. Um, the wrestling itself. It's got to be somebody like me that is really, 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 truthfully a, a people person. Uh, somebody that really enjoys talking to people, shaking hands, kissing babies. And a lot of wrestlers and people and superstar type people will, will celebrity type people will say they enjoy that. But really, they really don't. I, I, I really do enjoy it. I actually do. Uh, so the fan is so much out of it. I used to go wrestle. I wrestled in front of hundreds of thousands of people well, at a time, hundreds of thousands of people before several times, uh, Tokyo Dome, et cetera, et cetera. And I never met nobody at those shows, not one person, not radio winners, nothing. Uh, every once in a while, they get three or four people backstage that, that they was able to meet and shake some hands. So the independent circuit to me is just so much better for the fans. And if you're a female person like myself, it's actually pretty fun for you because you get to really meet the people and really shake their hands and, uh, you know, and still get paid to do what you love to do. So I, I actually love it. It does give more of a personal effect on the fans in the independent scene as opposed to going to a major show because it's just much harder to meet the guys you see at a major show. Oh, to the fans, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's a thousand, a thousand times better to the fans. Because they really get to come up close, not right next to you, get a picture with you, talk to you, shake your hand, ask that question, and that's something they'd never get a chance to do if if Nitro was still going on, and and they would never get a chance to do that with you. It's not it's not me that does that. It's our company. Our company doesn't allow that, but they would keep us backstage and hidden because superstars have a you know have a belief, of course, and it's somewhat true, a belief that the more touchable and accessible you are, the, the less of a star you are. And there is some truth to that, but there's also a lot of truth to the hundreds and thousands of people's lives I've touched, you know, one-on-one. They love me for being nice to them and shaking their hand and talking to them. So, you know, it, it's definitely a, uh, it's, it's a it's to me, it's worth it. I believe it. Now, you started out in 1990. What, would is, what was it like for you starting out then compared to the way people are starting out now? Well, I, I didn't know that because I'm not starting out now. Uh, by the looks of it, it's, um, it's a whole lot of course, but uh, for starters, back then you had two companies. Uh, I don't count. TNA is a company, and I love them to death, and just love to work for them, but I just, we all know that TNA is not a WCW. Um, I hope it will be one day, and wish them all the luck, and we're going to work for them hard if they call, but they're, they're not a WCW, let's take it back. So, it's much harder for wrestlers to kind of break in these days, of course. Um, but, wrestling is much more popular. Uh, and I, I kind of want to, I kind of like to believe and do believe that I was a trailblazer to the youth 
about pro wrestling. Uh, did speak it by age on TV when you watch wrestling when we were growing up. And you saw over men pro wrestlers. You saw men in the ring wrestling. There was no cruiserweight. There was no young kids. There was no young men. It was men, grown men, that were, you know, the pro wrestling what they were. And then when I came on the circuit, you noticed, you know, there was guys at home sitting on the court, and they would say, God, this, this kid's done this, why can't I? So, <laughs> the schools started opening, and WCW didn't even have a school when I was hired. And then we had the power plant, and then WCW had their school, and, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I do believe I was part of that trailblazing part of youth. It showed, you know, the world that you could be young and do this in the business. And and after that, you started seeing a lot more young guys in our, in our, in our, in our business. <laughs> you mentioned a lot about how WCW had the power plant and the WWF had their school. And, and we knew during this time there was a lot of uh, extreme measures being taken to compete with one another. Do you think in this time that too many lines were getting crossed into a, a, the personal life of a worker for the sake of competing with another company. Sorry to make you do this, man, but you have to ask that again. I hurt you. I didn't quite understand it. Ask me, ask me again. I'm sorry. My question was, I hurt you, but I didn't quite get it. It's all right. Uh, my question was that, do you think because of how strong the competition was, the way WCW and the WWF, the way they were competing with one another in the ratings, do you think too, some personal lines were crossed because of those reasons and that, how it transpired or affected a worker's personal life? Um, I, I, I don't, I'll try to answer this. I can't. I still don't I fully understand it. But, I, but my point, I think you're trying to get at, I'll, I'll try to answer it. Uh, the answer would be yes. Um, lives, were getting, lives were getting destroyed over what happened. Um, I've wrestled 70 good guys, 70, bro. Wow. Not, not 63, not 54, not 69, 70. I didn't meet them. I didn't shake their hands. I've wrestled 70. If I would have counted the ones that are dead that I've met or shook hands to, it would be 100 or something. So, lives are getting majorly destroyed. When you take hundreds of thousands of dollars away from men that are supporting their families, and you put it on the line, things happen and things did. And you get Chris Benoit stories and Eddie Guerrero's deaths and Bam Bam Bigelow's, and, and you get all this stuff that Rick Rude, Kurt Henning, and where's the stop, you know? I mean, the deaths were abundant. They were fast. They were quick. And it was the cause. They took livelihood away. Um, is it their fault that they're dead? Absolutely not. Uh, life happens and it's up to men to, you know, you know IBM, like people off the floor. Uh, I'm still here. Uh, I was making a million dollars a year to making a hundred thousand dollars a year. I had to sell my house, car, motorcycle. I had to sell everything that I worked my life to get. I had to sell to stay in business with them and was fired in a month. So, for, you know, for reasons it was a lie. So, if you're wrong created, I say my mother called in. Um, and that's the big thing that's going on on the internet right now. And, you know, Steve Austin had him against the road and was asking him the right question. But he never point blank, Jim. Jim was saying, you know, hey, I... You know, I got a job to do. I did the best I can. I I, I did fire above, but you know, it, 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 it's a dirty job what I had. And, but Steve never asked the question: Did you or did you not say and start the rumor? His mother called, and he, he never point blank. He just kind of let him dance around the question a little bit. But long story short, things like that, you know, happen. And when the merge happened, uh, you know, all the boys and fans knew that Buck Bible had a job. Now, I did, and I was scared to death. But the boys and everybody else, they, you know, pretty much, and the fans pretty much thought Buck Bible was fine. He was too secure. And, you know, the back of my mind, I was hopeful, thought I was okay. 
that I didn't know. Um, and sure enough, you know, two weeks later, you know, uh, me and Booker T are main event in Tacoma, Washington, where WCW didn't go. And what people don't remember is the next week was Atlanta. So why didn't they wait a week to put the first match of the invasion of two billionaire companies? Why would they not wait to put that match in the billionaire's backyard and said Turner instead of doing it 5,000 miles away? Yeah. So we knew in Tacoma, me and Booker did, that something was up. So my back to your question, but I don't get involved on that. Back to your question yet. Lives get destroyed. Lives get damaged because friends become enemies. Even I mean, when I walked into the WWF at the time, not WWE, the WWF from WCW. Here I'm coming in as you know, 30 years old, right? My prime. I'm a 10 year veteran. At the same time, I'm a young kid still. I'm 30. So, I mean, I'm like my prime in the best shape of my life, looking good, feeling good. And I come walking into a bunch of real powerful places. They used to be my friends. I mean, my, my great friends. And dealt with a lot of stuff backstage that I had to, you know, deal with. It was rough and it was hard. So, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was definitely the two companies working were very, very, very going to a lot of I can only imagine. I remember when you showed up on Monday Night Raw when they gave you and Booker T had that match and I was really happy to see you on there because I'm I remember watching WCW and you had a lot of talent that wasn't being used correctly, but then you saw guys that had a lot of promise and you rooted for them. You wanted to see them make it and you were one of those guys. To me at least. Oh absolutely. I was excited. Uh, a lot of people don't even know this, but uh, the very first night Shane McMahon went online and went on TV and had bought WCW as the storyline they were going with. Uh, this McMahon, if you look up with this online on YouTube or whatever, but this McMahon named five times. Like he was using an example with a VS satellite argument if it had summer had the fight. Yeah. I was very excited, you know, very, very, you know, you know about the applause I got, you know, the reaction I got when my name was mentioned at a WWF show is where the reaction came from. And so it was a very, very good thing. I was very excited. I went to the school like I was supposed to. They wanted us to go to school for a week and wear the 20 foot ring and do everything else. And so, you know, here I went from making, you know, like I said, making, you know, Twenty to thirty thousand, twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars by weekly. To I was making, you know, uh, six grand by weekly. So you know, it was a really, really, it was, it was dramatic um, to the point of, uh, you know, it's crazy to say a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I think it's one sixty, I think, or one seventy-five. But it was really amazing how little amount of money that is making the kind of money I was making at WCW. It, it was literally like. Going broke. I can I imagine. Went, I went broke. I can really imagine. It, it, like you said, you know, the business destroyed lives financially and personally. Yeah, it really did. Really now you said that you, you know, being in the business for ten years and longer. Um, 
who was one of the hardest people you had to work with, and why? You mean, uh, like, tough-wise, or you mean just hard to work with? Uh, both. Uh, uh, personally, um, I guess that's really, believe it or not, it's kind of a question to call this WCW, dude. You gotta realize, we were, we were all rich, we were all making money, we all worked together for years, we all were friends, but it was drama and, and stuff like that, but, but it would always get fixed and worked out. And so, uh, you know, money heals a lot of problems. And it kind of did it. Everybody made so much money. It was like, do we, do we really want to argue? I mean, my God, we're just, we're just get along with it, you know? Right. So, um, I'd have a hard time thinking that, man. I really would. I mean, you know, your gold books, those kind of guys were, were, were my best friends. But in the ring, they, they were tough because... You know, they didn't want to do certain things, and they didn't want to put guys over, maybe, and, you know, go through with it. Uh, like that, and everything, he just, he took it very serious, man. You know, it wasn't about a paycheck, the entertainment, who cares who wins or loses. You know, it got to be personal about, you know, who wins and who loses, and I'm not going to lose, and I'm not saying Goldberg did that, I'm saying a lot of guys did and... So, you know, it just, um, it, it really was, there's really not what it could like fit. It just really was a lot of egos in the company, and nobody wanted it. And somebody had to, and a lot of guys didn't like that. So it was a very, very egotistical, back-stabbing profession to be in that we tried to make professional because we made so much money. Understandable. Now, uh, interesting fact is that you started doing movie cameos and started doing TV shows not too long after this. And an interesting fact is that you did a movie called Terror Track, and you actually worked with a young Brian Cranston, the lead actor from Breaking Bad. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that was a lot of my stuff was still appearing. At the very show in. Yeah, but we got to in. Um... I did Day of the Warrior, which I was which I starred in. It was called Day of the Warrior. Uh, Andy Sedaris, an eleven-time Emmy winner, um, to produce the film, and he wanted Steamer and myself. And Steamer was married and didn't want to do it because there was a lot of DNA and you know, it was kind of a borderline, you know, sexual type, you know, as they call them, you know, Skinamax type movie, <laughs> um, you know. And uh, so I was. Uh, I was single at the time, and so, you know, it was just best that I did that. So, I, I no problem at all, I did it. I did two movies with Andy Sedaris, and that was in, like, the 98, 99 area uh, of Day of the Warrior, and another one called Return to Savage Beach. I started both those. And then, um, and then I was on um, the, uh, the witch show, Charmed. I was on Charm. I remember that. During WCW. And then the Terror Track was still WCW. I was still with WCW during Terror Track. Um, so, um, the only thing I did after after WCW, movie-wise and TV-wise and cameo-wise, was the Gigolo Show. Okay. And you also had a documentary yeah. about yourself, correct? Yeah, and I did a documentary about myself, and that just came out recently, but we had some problems with that because of uh, uh, the person that edited it did not get some releases of some movies that are in my documentary. Okay. So we're having to, we're having to um, get those removed before we put it back on sale so we don't get you know, sued. Understandable. What was one of the... The funniest moments you've ever experienced in your wrestling career? Uh, when we went out, when NWO went out and imitated the Four Horsemen. <laughs> and you were Kurt Henning, correct? I was Kurt Henning, yes. It was, to me, that was incredible television. That was groundbreaking. It was absolutely hilarious. To the Four Horsemen, it was not hilarious. They were very upset, very mad. 
He calls two or three fist fights in the backstage. Wow. He calls uh, a lot of friendship make up, but I thought it was absolutely hilarious. It's a great television and a great idea. So there wasn't, you guys didn't really run it by them or talk to them about this before doing it? You just went out and did it? I was so, I was so low on the total call at that stage of being in the NWO. I just shut my mouth and did what they told me. They, handed, they told me to create Kurt Henning. I went to the store and bought a ponytail, put my hat on, had a ponytail coming out the back, put a piece of gum in, had a towel, and everything was good to go. Interesting question. Um... Because of all these Marvel Universe movies coming out, have you ever considered probably trying out for a role as maybe one of these superheroes that are coming to life? Because you got a look, and you look like you would fit the part in some of these guys. I, I'm, I'm with uh, one of the biggest talent in, in Atlanta, and her name her name is Joy Perkins. Um, and I'm with her, and she gives me little things from time to time, but uh, you can't do anything more but to be with the number one talent in Atlanta, and I'm with them, um, you do that, and you have a manager, and you do the best you can, so it pretty much kind of goes back to, like, even the WWE, they they know where you're at, I mean, uh, I tried out for Magic Mike XXL, again. okay, uh, I, I tried out for Magic Mike XXL, and um, uh, it didn't, it was, uh, it went great, the tryout went great. And I asked the guy when I got there, I go, how did you, how did you, uh, find me? He said, I just Googled you. And I was like, well, how did you know I was in shape still? He goes, well, I just hope. So my <laughs> point is, if they, if anybody really wants you, I'm very easy to find. So, uh, you know, and so is anybody nowadays with the internet. So, you know, I, so many people always go, you know, why don't you call the WWF and ask for a kid to get a job back? And I'm like, because they know where I'm at. If they want me, they'll call me. Me calling them is just, it's just a waste of time. It really is. I can understand. Hey, I remember meeting you at one show, and I was really impressed with the way you took time out to help younger guys when it came to how to do the match, how to work the fans, things like that. And you, I could tell that it really means a lot to these guys who are on their way up with the knowledge they're getting from you. Matter of fact, there's a... A gentleman that I know is actually a buddy of mine by the name of the Iceman Tim Norton. He said you were one of the guys that he worked with, and he said it was like one of his favorite moments in his entire career. Absolutely. I really do. Like I said, I really do care about everything I do in this business, and that's, you know, um, is what's also so hurting and not having a job with, with Vince is because of all the stuff that I've done that, you know, I think there was even a report of the day a guy sent me about the Day of the Warrior movie I did 15, 18 years ago. And the clip, it's on my it's on my website or on my Instagram, Marcus Stuff Bagwell, but when you look at it, it's me with the ending outfit on, and it says I was the only only person ever that it came on set, and before I left, I thanked everybody on the set before I left. And... That, if you can multiply over a 26-year career, is exactly the way I was for 26 years. But the Internet, people that didn't know me, et cetera, et cetera, just shoot me and ate me alive. But it wasn't true. The true Mark Bagwell is, this person talking to you on the phone right now, the true Mark Bagwell is super nice, super humble, down to earth, very honest. Very, very honest, which I think people take, and it kind of goes against me sometimes because I tell the truth. And sometimes people don't like that. They want people to go with the flow and just shut their mouth, and I was more of telling the truth. Um, and some people don't like that. So, you know, yeah. I a lot of my heat, I think, being honest. Yeah, no one ever said honesty was pleasant. <laughs> no, no, it's not. So don't ever ask me because I'm going to say the truth. <laughs> Well, that's how it needs to be. Now, I understand you have your own line of... That's how, that's how it should be. And back to that real quick before we get off that. When Marcus Bagwell would tell the truth, there was no problem. When Buck Bagwell started telling the truth, then it would be. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? It yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, when Buck started saying it, then it was like, oh, who does he think he is? Yeah. I never changed. I was the same person the whole way. It just got 
Well, you did such a you did such a good job making Buff Bagwell be that guy that everybody was not supposed to like. He was a heel. Right. You know what I mean? You did a great job right. bringing that to life. <laughs> I mean, I had real heat. All they had to do, I didn't have to, I didn't have to cut nobody's vote on TV or rape a cheerleader or like Triple H did in a, in a casket. I didn't have to do all that. I, I had heat naturally. Just put me on TV and let me be me. I had heat, and they just. I, I offered that to them about year five of being fired. And I said, what are y'all doing? I mean, y'all even made a DVD that says heat stickers on it, and I'm on the cover. <laughs> I said, my God, call me a heat seeker, put me on TV, let me go. Let's make some money, let me be me. Yeah. And, of course, you know, you, this is a very political business, you know, so it didn't work. I, I can understand. I, I think at some point I kind of felt like as a fan who supported you and watched you, even when you were a heel or a face, when they did the Bagwell's mom on a forklift match, I just thought, this is kind of, this ain't right. <laughs> no, and not to mention, needless to say, that was up the last show ever. That was the last show ever. So, they had, they had lost track when they were going, man, and, you know, they make it David Arquette, world heavyweight champion, I and mean, come on, man, he's a buck 60. I mean, you know, it, it, it just didn't make sense. They were just going a totally wrong route. And when they merged with Time Warner, uh, you know, Time Warner didn't like wrestling, so, you know, it was very simple. When they merged, uh, they said, you know, we're done with it. So, it was over. Yeah, well, but it's good though. There's guys who look for opportunity or they look for new things to carry on. And I see right now that you have your own brand of nutritional supplements. Yeah, yeah, it's not my own brand. I work for a company called APS Nutrition. That's called APS Nutrition Advanced Promotions uh, Supplements. Uh, so it's called APS Nutrition. It's a great supplement company, and I work for that company. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're, they're great products. Check them out online. Uh, I'm in the middle of you know, a little bit of a lawsuit going on with my domain name, with my manager. But you, you, my website and my domain name is Real Buff Bagwell. And then I switched it over to Marcus Buff Bagwell. And then I, I, I lost the domain power through that, for the long story short. So I'm really trying to get all my social media worked out right now. So everybody's a little bit so over the next two or three weeks, there'll be a, an understanding video out that I'm going to do on YouTube and explain to everybody what went on and what happened. But um, I really don't know. I don't even have a website to really advertise except two of them. Real Buff Bagwell is me and Marcus Buff Bagwell. Both those are me. I'm just in the middle of trying to orchestrate getting, getting them uh, organized because my manager is not wanting to get any of passwords and it's just a little bit, you know, some business that i got to get solved. Understandable. Well, if fans still wanted to find you, you know, and learn more about you from your wrestling career and what you're doing now, what's the best way for them to find you? The best way right now, like I just said, would be just Marcus Buff Adwell, uh, and that, that's the one that's up now that, the most, that, that is me. But I'm having a hard time getting my domain name over, switched over to me, and me having all the passwords to it. Um, so I'm having a hard time getting that. But right now, that Marcus Buck tag was my Twitter, Facebook, everything. And, and, with, and with Twitter, it's Mark Buck Bagwell, because Marcus is too many letters. But Mark Buck Bagwell, Twitter, and everything else is Marcus Buck Bagwell. And you can reach me through all that. Awesome. Instagram, everything. Well, we really want to thank you for taking the time out today. It's really been a lot of fun getting your views and thoughts and getting to, you know, just to get to pick your brain and hear the stories that you tell. You know, you never know who you might be inspiring and who's learning from you. Sure, absolutely. That's why I always take time out and talk to the Iceman guy and just put all my energy into everybody. So thank you for your time. And uh, if you want to do it again, we'll do it again. So enjoy the time, man. Most definitely. Do you give us a little, uh, your little catchphrase before we go? I'm both on the stuff and the girls just can't get enough. <laughs> you heard it right here on the Turnbuckle Pad Podcast, fans. Stay tuned. <laughs>